Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are going to provide a, a, an overview of the Public Impact Projects at Smaller Organizations grant program. We are very excited about this new grant program at the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we are so happy that you have come out to see the overview and learn a little bit more about the program. My name is Trisha Brooks. I am a Senior Program Officer in the Division of Public Programs at the NEH, and I am joined by my colleague Jill Austin, another Senior Program Officer in the Division. So today we're going to provide a brief overview of the National Endowment for the Humanities, who we are, what the humanities are, and a little bit about a new initiative that this grant program is part of. Then we'll talk about some of the specifics of the public impact projects at Smaller Organizations grant program. We'll give a little bit of an overview of the program. We'll talk about the general goals, the types of activities that are supported by this grant, and what's included in the application for the grant program. And we'll talk a little bit about the application process and the review process. And then we'll provide some tips for success in applying to the NEH and some contact information in case you would like some further assistance. So what is the National Endowment for the Humanities? We are an independent federal agency that offers grant support for projects that engage with humanities disciplines uh, that work with humanities ideas and, and approaches from the humanities. In the year 2022, we awarded over $136 million in grant funding to mostly organizations, but in some cases, some grant programs are available to individuals. Our organization is set up with a chair at the head of the organization. Our current chair, who was appointed by President Biden, is Shelley Lowe. She was presidentially appointed and confirmed by the Senate. She is the second woman to chair the endowment, and she's the first Navajo. Uh, she is assisted as advisors to her uh, by a body of 26 individuals called the National Council on the Humanities. And they are private citizens who are engaged in the humanities in a range of different ways. And they are also all appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So I said that we support the work of the humanities, that we support humanities ideas and approaches. But what does that mean? What are the humanities? The humanities are the various fields of study that re reflect on human culture, on the meaning of heritage, traditions, and history of human culture. So that can be any number of fields that look at culture. It can be musicology, it can be art history, literary criticism, philosophy, history, anthropology. We have a new initiative that uses humanities fields to look at uh, increasing equality across the country. So, the new initiative is American Tapestry Weaving Together Past, Present, and Future, and it encourages projects that use humanities to advance equality for all. Through this initiative, the NEH intends to reach a much broader set of communities to amplify a diversity of stories, particularly undertold stories of historically underrepresented groups. So I'm going to pass things off to Jill to talk a little bit more about our newest grant program that is part of this American Tapestry Initiative. Thank you very much, Tricia. Uh, well, everyone, thanks for being here today. Let's get into uh, the, the particulars of this new program. Uh, this is aimed at supporting small and mid-sized organizations. We'll talk about that, uh, that realm of the criteria and intended applicants a bit later. 
Uh, but today we really want to try to meet you as a small or mid-sized organization where you are. We really want to help you through this program to broaden your audience reach, to think about the communities you're working with, who haven't you been working with, uh, who is right in your neighborhood, who you could be engaging with. We really want you to use this program to try to deepen that kind of engagement with your community through strengthening your own interpretive skill set or also working more collaboratively or creatively with people who are right in your midst. Interpretation then is, is at the core of this new program. We really want you to focus on strengthening your interpretive excellence. And we will discuss a, a couple of different ways that that can play out, but interpretive improvement or strengthening or expansion really should be the focus of your proposal and the case that you're making for funding under this program. You can opt to use, uh, use these monies to increase uh, staff interpretive skills. That can include uh, leadership, that can include staff working really on the front lines with your community, your audiences, as well as volunteers. Don't forget about those volunteers. You can also use this grant program to potentially expand the stories that you're telling, those interpretive narratives. What hidden gems are in your collections or have been on your mind for a long time uh, that you really haven't brought to light? Ways that you could maybe tell your story and your community stories differently by taking a closer look. Key questions to this grant program for you involve um, considering what are your organization's interpretive humanities needs or programmatic goals? What is it you need to do? Uh, what are you lacking in, in terms of resources? And what do you really want to do or aspire to do? How would meeting these needs or goals benefit your public audiences? We encourage you to think critically about the humanities programming that your organization currently offers and also to assess your organization's um, relationship to your community and surrounding neighborhoods. Again, what have you been focused on? What have you not been focused on? I think, can you really take a hard look uh, at um, what you can plan for for the future? and strengthening that interpretive skill set. Okay, eligibility, let's get into it. Uh, applicants must be registered 501c3 nonprofits. Uh, you can be an independent nonprofit. Uh, you can also be affiliated with a state or local government agency, uh, an accredited college or university, or a federally recognized tribal government agency, for example. Uh, so um, you must maintain your own staff and budget, for example, if you happen to be a subordinate organization to a larger organization, such as a university art gallery, perhaps, or a cultural center that is part of a county government or a state government, other kind of municipality. Those kinds of organizations may also be considered. Okay. In terms of eligibility, too, uh, we have a bit of a list here. Uh, for uh, criteria through which we ask you to self-identify when you read that notice of oppor uh, funding opportunity, uh, we will also ask you to complete an organizational profile form that is part of this application. So be sure when you're reading through that notice of funding opportunity that you look out for that. We ask that our organizations meet at least two of the following criteria. And remember, these are these are all you know optional in terms of the point of identifying with two of them. Uh, your annual operating budget is one million dollars or under. 
you are in a community with a population of 300,000 people or fewer. Your employed staff totals 50 people or fewer, and that can include a mix of full time and part time. You also may rely on volunteers uh, or part time staff to conduct substantial daily operations, a strong reliance on volunteers or part time people. And that your core mission uh, is to interpret undertold stories or uh, represent under uh, represented uh, core audiences or communities, and those could include a range of different uh, communities such as communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, uh, residents of rural areas, for example, uh, US religious minorities, uh, people in communities experiencing persistent poverty, for example. So there is a range of them. We ask you to look at them carefully. And when you're applying, meet two of these and explain how you do. We also wanted to say that we encourage new applicants to NEH and also those who have never received NEH funding before. Okay. Here is an overview of the process. Uh, the deadline for the program is June 28th. It's coming up. Uh, the maximum funding is uh, up to funds up to $25,000. Project start dates range uh, from the earliest starting date of March 1st, 2024 through a window of May 1st, 2024. Project periods may uh, be in a range from one to two years. And decisions uh, on funding uh, will be made uh, with notifications in December, most likely of 2023, just at the end of the year. And now I will turn things back over to Tricia Brooks. All right, thank you. So, <clears throat> What can you do with this funding from this grant program? There are three major areas of activities that this program will fund. Again, all with interpretation at the core. So everything has to very much be connected to interpretation, to expanding and strengthening the interpretation at your organization. So first of all, Program evaluation is one of the major types of activities. You might choose to assess your current interpretive programs. How are you connecting with audiences? Are your current interpretive programs uh, communicating the messages that you intend for them to communicate? You might want to evaluate your reach. Are you reaching? the community that you want to reach? Are there communities you're not reaching that you want to be able to reach? How can you reach those communities with your interpretive programs? You could also choose to, to evaluate what types of programs you might want to offer. What are some possibilities of programs that your community might be interested in? Or you might have a program that you're planning to offer and you might want to do some evaluation about exactly what kinds of things people are interested in learning on the topics that you want to explore or what types of interpretive techniques might be most appealing to your audience or might work most effectively for that topic. You could also work with an interpretive consultant to come in and do things like look at the collections that you have and help you identify opportunities of new stories, stories that you might not have thought to tell, but that your collection or that your community or that the other resources that you have available to you are really ripe to tell these stories. And then you could conduct benchmarking visits, you could say, we want to find out about some other best practices for interpretation. We want to look at strategies that other organizations are using and maybe incorporate some of those strategies in the work that we're doing here. So you could take a trip to see what's happening at another site. So the second type of activity would be professional development. So 
we know that it can be very difficult to have the time, but even more so to have the funds to support sending your staff and your volunteers out to get training um, to really enhance their interpretive skills. So you could send staff or volunteers to a conference, to a workshop, to some other type of professional training, a webinar that is offered by, say, a professional organization like the American Alliance for Museums or the Association, American Association for State and Local History, perhaps, just as two examples. But you could also develop interpretation that's very specific, I mean, training that's very specific to the interpretive needs at your site. So it could be training on how to specifically interpret stories that you're telling. If you're telling sensitive stories about sensitive parts of history for your community. Maybe you want to bring someone in who can help your, your interpreters, volunteer and staff interpreters, to tell the story in a way that they're very conscious to what audiences are, are getting in touch with when they're learning this history. Maybe it's a very challenging story, or maybe it's just a story that you haven't told at your site and you want to enhance their knowledge of the content or just simply enhance their skills as interpreters. And then the third type of activity that's funded here is actually developing and implementing an interpretive product. So you might want to create an exhibition, you might want to create a tour of a historic district in your area, or maybe you are at a site, you wanna create a tour or a public program. Um, we really encourage you to think about ways of incorporating the community into the public programming that you develop, doing some community curation or co-creation for projects, bringing people into the work of doing the interpretation and also of um, maybe doing some of the research or, or other elements of putting together an exhibition or a public program. Um, and we are also, through this program, able to fund your ability to create public interpretive programs that help to expand the reach and the impact of any traveling exhibitions that you bring to your site. This grant will not pay for the expenses of bringing the exhibition to your site or for presenting programming or things like that that are already developed by those who develop the ex exhibition. But let's say you bring an exhibition to your site and you want to tell a local story that's connected to that, or you want to do a public program where you bring in speakers or you bring in local members of the community who are related to stories that are connect that connect to the exhibition. This grant program can support your development of public programming that would enhance that experience of hosting a traveling exhibition. The final thing is that you can actually combine these different approaches. You don't have to pick one or the other. You can choose to do an exhibition and to at the same time support training for your staff on, on general interpretive techniques. You can bring in a, a consultant to help you discover new stories within your collection or help you build new stories around your site and you can at the same time um, bring in the public to create a public program. So you can combine multiple aspects to create a strategy that really addresses what your site needs, what your organization really needs to um, uh, enhance the interpretation that you offer. So this application if you have familiarity with applying to the National Endowment for the Humanities, is actually a much more streamlined and hopefully a much easier application to pull together than most of our applications, certainly than the other applications in, from the Division of Public Programs. Um, there are kind of two sets of things that you have to think about when you're applying to the NEH. 
One is those application elements that are described in the notice of funding opportunity. And the notice of funding opportunity is the document that explains all the details of the grant program and everything you need to know about applying to the program. And in that notice, it will describe a narrative, a very short maximum five page narrative that you need to uh, include the organizational profile that Jill mentioned, which just asks you to provide some demographic information about your audience, about your geographic area, uh, some statistics about your organization. And then a work plan, which is just a short laying out of how you want to approach achieving the goals that you set forward in your grant application. And then finally, some short bios. You want to include short one or two paragraph bios of each of the key staff people at your organization and the key uh, consultants, scholars, and others from your community that you will be working with uh, to develop the program. All of those four aspects of the application, you will write those and you will turn them into PDFs and then you will attach them to what's called the attachment form, which is part of the second part of what you have to think about when applying to the NEH, which is your grants.gov application package. So all applications are submitted through grants.gov and that application package includes the SF-424, which is called the um, application for federal domestic assistance. It's a short form that just asks things like, you know, what's the title of the project that you're applying for? Um, and then you'll have an NEH cover sheet that asks four pretty simple questions about how much you're requesting from the NEH. And then um, you'll have a site performance location form just asking about where the project is going to take place. Then you'll have a budget form and the budget form will just ask you to explain what the different expenses are for the project. And all of those forms are found on grants.gov website. And back to Jill for our next section. Thank you, Tricia. Let me get everything advanced. OK, so back to the people part. We talked a lot about the nuts and bolts uh, from Tricia on the previous slide. Let's talk about the people you'll work with, uh, professionals you'll work with, experts. Uh, we really uh, do want you to look outside yourself, get outside of your own head, uh, get outside of the work you're doing day to day, get outside of your organization to really bring in a couple of professionals to work with you. So on that note, we do require that you work with at least two outside professional people or a, a local expert. I will explain these um, in, uh, in succession. Um, there are fewer requirements to work with an advisory body here on this project and proposal than we uh, typically require in our other grant programs in public program as uh, public programs as Tricia mentioned earlier. So here under public impact projects, we require that you work with at least one scholar or an interpretive consultant. At least one. So a scholar could be someone uh, with an advanced degree in the humanities in a discipline that's appropriate to what you're doing. Um, perhaps it's a literature person, uh, an urban historian, uh, perhaps a regional historian, for example, uh, someone who's teaching or has published writing on a subject that's relevant to you and ideally is someone who uh, updates uh, that scholarship. Um, you know, pretty, pretty regularly. So you're really looking to somebody with the latest perspectives on this aspect of the field. And or you could work with a consultant who might be an interpretive planner, an interpretive consultant, an exhibition designer, uh, perhaps an experienced public forum moderator or discussion facilitator. If that's the, the route that you're thinking of taking, it could also be a user experience designer, a UX designer, uh, or visitor experience designer. If you're also thinking about 
um, the ways in which visitors will experience your space or also experience a platform or online experience that you're thinking of creating. So keep that in mind, a scholar or consultant, then you'll need to work with at least one community advisor who is local to you. This could be an elder in your community, it could be a culture bearer, a local historian, a community leader of some kind, but someone with a deep local knowledge that is lived uh, and, and really can impart uh, the kinds of perspectives that you'll need uh, to share this important lived history with your audiences. You may certainly work with more people beyond uh, this immediate one to two uh, requirement on that, that scholar or consultant side, and then that at least one community advisor side. You can always go higher, but this is what we require at a minimum. Okay, now we're getting back into nuts and bolts, uh, steps for applying. This is extremely important to get to that point of uh, completing all of the requirements that Tricia had outlined a few minutes ago. Here's what you need to do now. If you have not already done so, start your engines. Uh, you will need to register for a SAM uh, registration for your, your organization, and that means a system of award management. Uh, so you'll go to SAM.gov. You will request a unique entity identifier or UEI if you have not done so already. This can take some time, so start early if you intend to take advantage of this June 28th deadline. It can take a couple of weeks to get this in motion. Then you'll need to register with grants.gov if your organization has not done so already. Again, this can take a couple of weeks time to get everything underway. And while you're waiting for all of that to come through, you can be working on your, on your proposal, the text itself. We also uh, suggest strongly that you, that you follow the directions in the notice of funding opportunity very carefully read through it carefully. Uh, these are tips that we will repeat uh, over and over if you ever speak with us and watch our webinars. And you can access this information in the link below. This is on our public programs landing page, our resource page. Uh, you'll go to www.neh.gov forward slash program forward slash public impact projects smaller organizations. So you can copy uh, this, this address directly from the slide if you like, paste it in your browser, or go directly to our NEH website and do a search for this program. The application review process. This is approximately a six month review process. It can take some time. It's, it can be hard to wait to find out after all of that hard work if you're getting an award. Uh, these are, are the main steps. Once your application comes through, uh, it will be reviewed by staff and we will organize all of the applications into different panels, kind of equally distributed across different panels. Uh, and we will recruit what we call peer reviewers, people from the field who uh, are humanities scholars or subject experts, and also people who have experience working in small and mid-sized organizations, museums and historic sites, or cultural centers, for example, who are very much immersed in the field and the, and the level of work that is required at the small museums level. So we're really working with people who know what it's like to work in a small museum and know what the challenges are and also know what the rewards are. So we'll be looking, as I said, at experts in these humanities disciplines and public programming professionals too. And that can include people who do work directly with the public on collaborative projects, uh, discussion programs, or other educational programs. After the peer review process, uh, all of the proposals will go to the National Council. And as Tricia mentioned earlier, this is a body of 26 professionals appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate who are working with us. And so they will have an opportunity to read proposals, uh, look at the recommendations and ask questions of staff. Uh, and they will also pose questions and impart advice 
to our NEH chair, who ultimately makes the final decisions on funding. And again, we anticipate that notifications on uh, awards will be made in December, the end of this year. Okay. And then we'll get into review criteria. When you look at the notice of funding opportunity, you will be able to see the review criteria that we are asking the peer reviewers to consider when reviewing your applications. Uh, so the first one, for example, is about audience and institutional impact. Uh, what, uh, in what ways would this project expand or strengthen your organization's ability to provide quality humanities interpretation? Uh, in, what, in what ways uh, would this fill a need within your organization or within your community and your audience? What are the impacts of, for the immediate future or the long term? And that's something you all can be thinking about. Are you looking for, to make an immediate impact or also be planning out for a longer term impact? The second criteria is relationship to the humanities. How would the project utilize or explore humanities ideas and resources and content? The third criteria is about project feasibility, the practical nature of it all. How do the proposed formats and activities that you'd like support for align with your project goals? Does everything make sense? All of these bits and pieces, do they all make sense in service of being able to accomplish what you want to accomplish? Again, under kind of a, a nuts and bolts practical nature, are the work plan and the budget reasonable? Does everything make sense? Uh, are the reviewers confident that, that uh, this will all come together effectively for you, again, to do what you want to do? Another criteria regards personnel. You, uh, what, uh, what are the qualifications of the personnel on the project team? Uh, this could include uh, full-time employees, part-time employees, or volunteers, for example. Who will be leading this, this project? And then, uh, what is the relevance, the relevant experience of the outside cons consultants and uh, the advisors who will be working with you? Uh, are, these, are these good people in service to your project? Does it make sense? Do you have a sense, uh, as a reviewer, from that perspective, of uh, whether or not this kind of person would be effective in that role. And then we ask about institutional suitability. Does your organizational profile align well with at least two of the criteria that we have that emphasize small and mid-sized organizations? And that comes from that criteria that I mentioned a few minutes back um, that you can read in full in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Finally, we ask reviewers for an overall summary, an overall assessment of the, of, the, of the project. We ask reviewers to think about strengths and weaknesses, any concerns, but overall what, uh, what you and your organization and your public stand to gain from this project as a whole. And then there are the best practices. This is a little bit like uh, more of a nuts and bolts question. Uh, we will repeat these tips again and again, as you will hear from us. Uh, best practices to keep in mind whenever you are requesting NEH funding. Here I go already repeating myself. Read that notice of funding opportunity. Sometimes we say, read it again. Uh, <laughs> Read it early and often. Um, it is, and as Tricia had also said, we've tried to make this a more streamlined process and a shorter notice of funding opportunity. But some of those pages can be substantial still when we include language that is required of us. So please do read through carefully. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, review criteria that I just read through, you can look at those on pages 27 and 28 of the Notice of Funding Opportunity. You can also submit a draft to us. The draft deadline, it's completely optional. 
uh, but that deadline is about a, a month from now, a little over a month from now on May 24th by midnight, just before midnight. Uh, so you'll have a full day to get that submitted to us for some feedback. And I would say, even if it's just a couple of pages, it can make a big difference in just getting some direct feedback from people like me or Tricia and our other colleagues uh, to help uh, point you in the right direction and maybe we can identify some questions or needs that you haven't necessarily noticed as you're as you're putting this all together. On that note, we really advise you to be straightforward, clear and concise uh, in your writing. And I would say on that note, don't assume that readers who may be a peer reviewer, it may be a member of NEH staff, it could be the chair, it could be a member of the National Council. Don't assume that any of these potential readers will know as much about your community, your organization, or your, your topic, or, or the nature of your project as you do. You are so immersed and intimately aware of what's going on at your organization and what your needs are and what the challenges are and what your, what your aspirations are. Be very clear and transparent in, in laying all of this out so we can keep up along with you and understand what your project is and what your needs are. So making your case, be persuasive. Make it clear that you need this NEH funding to be able to do something different, to strengthen your interpretation, uh, to strengthen your staff and the, uh, the, and, the, and the volunteers to really lend them new tools for their interpretive skill set. Show us what the impact will be. Help us imagine how this will make a difference for your organization and your community. And then be sure to double check that you have all of the required supporting materials, all of those different attachments. They're all in PDF form. Uh, it can be very helpful to uh, not only register early for SAM and grants.gov, but also start submitting all of those files. Start that application process early. Don't wait until the last day and don't wait until the day before. I would start at least a few days early because if something goes awry in, the, in that application process where a file just doesn't make it across that threshold in, in grants.gov, you'll have time to go back in and resubmit it. Uh, and so if you do it early enough, you can look out on your email constantly and your spam folders to make sure that uh, if, you, if you've gotten a message that something has gone wrong or is incomplete, you have time to go back and fix it. Okay, that's what I have to say for now. I'm going to turn it back over to Tricia to continue. All right, so um, one of the biggest tips, one of the most important things that you can do to be successful is to contact us. We mean that very seriously. Sometimes people think, oh, it's the federal government. No one's going to answer the phone. No one's going to get back to me. We will. <laughs> we will talk to you at length about your project. So what can we as program officers do to assist you? We can answer your questions about the grant program. We can offer you advice. What are we looking for? We try to be as transparent as possible when we write the notice of funding opportunity, but we can help you to better understand what you can tell us about your project to make your proposal even more persuasive and more competitive for funding. And we'll provide you feedback on a draft. As Jill said, the draft uh, deadline is May the 24th at midnight. We strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to take advantage of submitting even just a part of your application to that deadline so that we can review it and the program officer can give you feedback and help you with making your case as strongly as you possibly can. Just a couple of reminders before we go. Again, register for SAM and grants.gov now. And if you're registered, if you know your organization is already registered, check and make sure that your registration is up to date because if your registration has lapsed at SAM by I think it's 
uh, might be six months at SAM, I, I can't remember, but if it's lapsed by a year at grants.gov, if you haven't used it for a year, they make it dormant and you have to revive it. So you want to check now, make sure it's active and up to date. Your, your location address is current on your SAM registration and everything is up to date. And if you're registering now, it can take you about a month to get through the SAM and the grants.gov registration. So do it now. Uh, take advantage of that optional draft review on May the 24th. That's a very important. Submit all your attachments as PDFs. Don't forget that's what trips up so many people. They leave something off as a PDF and their application is declared ineligible because they didn't convert something to a PDF. Um, remember that the deadline is June 28th. Again, as Jill just said, don't wait until June 28th to submit. You want to submit early so that you can catch any problems and address them before midnight. Eastern time on June the 28th. And again, call a program officer. We will talk to you. We want to talk to you. We want you to make the best case for your project. So we want to help you do that. So thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, please uh, public PGMS at neh.gov is the general email address for our division. That is where you should submit your drafts. Um, you can find more information on our website, neh.gov. And you can always contact Jill or me directly. Our email addresses are right here, J Austin, Austin with an I, A-U-S-T-I-N, at neh.gov, or Trisha Brooks, which is P for Patricia Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S at NEH.gov. We would be happy to hear from you. We look forward to seeing your applications. Please reach out to us with any questions. Thank you so much for your time.